Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. Love, love, love this company. You'll be hearing all about them later from me later in the episode. But now, on with the show. And I think Bitcoin is perfectly placed for you know to grow out of this in, in terms of the money. Or in that plays into the game theory that we just talked about of adoption being driven to the upside for Bitcoin. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined by Charles Edwards of Capriol Investments. Charles, how you doing, my man? Very well, Michael. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. There's a whole bunch of topics that I want to get into with you. Uh, you wrote a really great memo to kind of kick off the year, right? Where you did a 2021 in review for crypto and then kind of uh, uh, looking forward into 2022, both your thoughts on sort of the macro and also zooming into some of the more microstructure, microstructure things of crypto. So I'd love to hear if you could just kick us off with how do you think 2021 ended? What's your broad kind of macro outlook for 2022? 2021 was a great bull market for crypto. I think for Bitcoin, pretty mediocre just just numbers wise if you look at the growth that bitcoin saw is less than 60 percent through the whole year which Mm -hmm. is orders of magnitude less than prior years um we did see some really exciting developments early in the year particularly in late 2020 as well a lot of institutional adoption or we did at early stages but it didn't quite follow through in the latter part of the year Obviously, there's a big shock from the China ban, caused a lot of stress on the system, recovered very well into the late part of the year, which is a great sign of strength. But a lot of the sort of typical retail volume and, and crypto trades kind of moved into altcoins. Um, and you did see stronger growth from an address perspective, for example, in, in networks like Ethereum. It's not necessarily a problem for Bitcoin long term, and it it's just a changing market, right? So very different behavior. Nonetheless, positive developments across the board. You know, the um, hash rates are at all-time highs recently. Uh, and after the biggest, you know, sec- you know, second biggest or one of the largest economies in the world banning it, and that was where all of the network was, was centered, that recovery is a huge sign of strength. And I think we're going to see a lot of positive developments as well this year. But just um, that institutional adoption... Is, has caused a lot of changes. Just the size of Bitcoin as well. It's, you know, just a couple of years ago, it was 100, 100 billion. Now it's, it's hit that trillion dollar mark. Maybe not today. It's uh, changing every day, of course. But the size of it and, and how uh, it takes a lot more dollars to move that market has just changed um, how Bitcoin behaves. So we did see less growth to the upside, a lot of the usual volatility, which obviously presents opportunities. Um, and then going forward, I think we can expect more institutional adoption. I think we can expect the first 10 years of Bitcoin to be less relevant as a benchmark for what to expect into the future, whether that be the metrics and data you look at um, and also the growth rates we can expect. In terms of like raw numbers, I think there'll be a lot of growth for Bitcoin, but in terms of the percentage changes and, and the just general behavior, a lot has changed. It, 2021 is and and triggered by Corona 2020 really a pivotal a pivotal year in in where things go from here. Why do you think Bitcoin has kind of underperformed due to or within the context of previous bull markets? Because if you kind of zoom uh, you know go back to March of 2020 when this whole bull market kicked off, you had this unbelievable uh, backdrop. For Bitcoin, right? You had an enormous amount of liquidity that was flooding into the system, right? Uh, There was this narrative that really caught on, which is Bitcoin is a store of value, and you really saw it tear higher. But then, you know, like you said, 2021 was actually a pretty mediocre year uh, for Bitcoin, and a lot of money ended up rotating into alt. So, what do you think the reason is for that? Yeah, it's it's a few parts. I think obviously the the macro trade um, from Corona was was big. We also had the halving, where you expect the year following the halving to be extremely strong growth. That played out to Bitcoin textbook very well, um, but the institutional adoption didn't really follow through. So obviously we got Tesla, which is great, and and uh, Michael Saylor making a lot of acquisitions, but then sort of that March to April, May period kind of just slowed down. And you had did have a lot of people obviously overexposed to Bitcoin, pushing up extreme, um, you know, perpetual and, and leverage rates, which was, was showing the market and, and obviously later helped trigger a, a, a correction. And then we had that really bad news right in the kind of early to mid stages of the bull market with China. Um, so I think 
you know, if that China news hadn't happened, it probably would have been a bit different perhaps, but it did happen. I think it, it caused a lot of people to, to stay out of the, out of the market. You know, I, I was kind of March, April, May expecting we'll probably just continue to rally through much of the year into sort of September, October. So that May um, in, in series of incidents was quite surprising. Um, so I think that's one element. And then I think that would have probably turned off potentially some institutions in the, in the near term. Uh, at the same time, I do think there are a, a quite a lot, probably at least half a dozen or a dozen major institutions who have acquired Bitcoin on their balance sheet or are still doing so and haven't announced it. Just the way the last six months, um, last six months of 2021, there was pretty consistent block outflows of like a billion dollars or half a billion dollars from Coinbase and other exchanges. So I do think institutional adoption is happening and there'll be continue to be a series of trigger points in the coming year or two, which will, which will inspire that and cause large price shocks upwards. So I think the risk reward is definitely still skewed upwards, but all this was kind of happening and there wasn't quite the follow through. There were more risk factors, I suppose, for a bull run. And then I think a lot of retail thought, oh, I've missed Bitcoin. Mm. You know, it's $50,000. Just that number alone sounds scary to a lot of people who are not used yeah. to the market. Um, so I think they were looking for other opportunities in altcoins. And then at the same time, there was a lot of innovation in 2019 and 20 in altcoins, um, which has, has produced tangible, usable value today across particularly DeFi and GameFi. You know, there's a lot of people in the Philippines who live just playing games full time and earning a living through crypto based gaming. So that's one element and you can earn yield and, and, theoretically have lower risk exposure with stable coins and, and all these elements and, and different opportunities. And then people looking for quick wins and, and to steer away from that more complex, slower moving beast that is Bitcoin in, in 2022 and 2021, of course. Yeah. How important do you think a strong Bitcoin is for the overall crypto market in general? I think today it's critical. Uh, it could become less so into the future. It, it stems from, you know, Bitcoin was the first and biggest asset and, and all asset classes in general kind of link from bigger to smaller. And mm. we see that now, obviously, with, you know, bond markets kind of drive stock markets. Stock markets are now driving Bitcoin. Bitcoin kind of drives alts. And all of that correlates much higher to the downside. So if things are relatively neutral or positive, then each individual asset class can kind of do what it wants, you know, give or take and all else equal. But if things are going down, then they cascade down with higher impact on the lower class. So that's, you know, like this recent correction of 52, I think it is percent for Bitcoin last two and a half months. The impact on the majority of alts is significantly higher. Um, they're also smaller, they're less, they're less liquid. So that liquidity and all those elements means that when you do get sizable selling, they have larger downside impact. So it's not kind of, that's not surprising. For any smaller asset class, you kind of expect that, particularly if it's a growth asset class as opposed to what you might call values. So um, alts, which have very high use cases or tangible you know, value derivation today versus those which just have a roadmap and an idea with nothing behind it, they're, they're going to get hit harder on the downside. The other factor is that through 2016, 17 and kind of 18, 19 a bit, all the trading pairs are against Bitcoin. So mm. Bitcoin goes down, it had kind of a, you know, impact to the others through that trading pair. But now we're seeing a big shift to stable coins as the main pair for most things. So it's definitely possible as, as the market matures that other altcoins gain significant size and it's less directly tied to Bitcoin, but perhaps, you know, Ethereum or others are, are also just linked to the stock market perhaps. Um, that relationship's not really there now. I'm just projecting that maybe in a couple of years that will be more, more the case. Um, and in general, I think crypto as a sort of tech finance industry is going to merge and almost become indifferentiable between traditional finance over the coming next, either this next cycle or the one after. And we, we see that today with, with banks and, and stock exchange platforms offering crypto. And, and most of them are already doing that or have plans to do it today. And you also within crypto, you have, you know, um, pegged stocks, which you can trade Amazon or Tesla or what have you. And there's questions about legality and things, but they're very quickly kind of merging these industries together. So 
Um, yeah, it's just we have to expect the macro environment, macro being, you know, bonds, the Fed, the S&P, uh, monetary policy, you know, big debt cycles, etc., to have a bigger impact on this industry, particularly as it as it grows in size. Yeah. So that kind of leads into my next question here, which is we're recording this on January 27th, right? This is just after an FOMC meeting, which just happened yesterday. And kind of the big thing that markets are chewing over right now is how hawkish is the Fed going to be in 2022? It's hard to keep up. I mean, I, I think the market is pricing in, uh, you know, it's like 100% chance of four or even more than four rate hikes uh, in 2022. People are very concerned about quantitative tightening, which is the process that's not just tapering, uh, you know, buying assets in QE, but it's actually shedding assets on their balance sheet in general. Folks are very, very concerned about this. So what are your thoughts overall on the Fed's actions uh, in 2022? And how is that going to tie into crypto markets? Yeah, if, like, if you put yourselves in their shoes, where they're, they're in a difficult spot, uh, at least the people who are in that leadership today and a function of the system, I suppose. Um, we're at the back end of an 80, 100 year debt cycle. Um, so if you want to learn more about that and how it can have a big impact on society, definitely check out uh, Ray Dalio's new book, uh, Changing World Order. But effectively, debt is massive at the moment. Um, you know, 400 plus percent of, of, of GDP is the total. Each individual class, private, public, over 100 percent. Growth is relatively low, like, um, organic growth so when the corona, you know when corona happened we're already at a lot of red flags we already had yield curve inversion suggesting there could be a recession so that really triggered a lot of pain the only tools that the fed had left was to print so they printed massively all the markets rallied from that um, and that did its job for what they were trying to do which is regain that employment rate and um and prop up markets and liquidity in the near term so they're now faced with large inflation which is now impacting uh, impacting everyone's everyday life so that's a political issue too which needs to be resolved and it's more important at the moment than necessarily you know number go up for the stock market <laughs> so they've made the the decision that they should try and control that with three rate rise this year and, and for the next i think is the the plan i don't think they'll get through that plan i think it's too aggressive um because of how much debt we have, you know, in the seventies, when they started a new regime and aggressively tried to tackle inflation, they came from a much lower baseline for debt, but it's just so different now. It's just doesn't seem sustainable to be that aggressive. Um, so that, uh, yeah, so the, the market priced in that that wasn't going to happen yesterday. The expectation is now around 90% that they will have a rate hike, uh, next meeting. I think they'll probably get one or two in this year, um, pending any really major corrections and volatility in the stock market. They, the Fed usually historically doesn't care if it's like less than a 20% correction, unless it's very fast and very quick. Yeah. We're at about 12% now, so it doesn't even, it wouldn't register on their radar, particularly with the inflation where it's at. Um, so I, I expect they'll, they'll try and get a rate rise out in March, unless we see significant correction in stocks from here. Um, but all else equal, the stock market, if you look at traditional metrics for recessions, that sort of thing, it doesn't look too bad. Um, things like unemployment numbers, they look very good. Manufacturing indices look very good. Corporate profits are going up. New housing starts look very good. The only major red flag is obviously the high debt and the inflation. And then the question mark is how much of all of these numbers is just propped up by cheap money. And I obviously think a large amount is. So if they start to reduce their balance sheet, tighten, will that cause these other areas of the market to have issues? Quite possibly. But at the moment, they look healthy enough. So it makes sense that they will try and do some tightening. I just don't think they're going to get to the level they want to. If they did... There's a good argument to be made that if they did do, you know, seven rate hikes in, in two years, that the entire uh, Corona rally could just be retraced, which is, you know, bring us back to 2020 type levels. You know, that's a 30% down move from the top. I don't think it will happen, as I said, because I think they will just have to change their plan as it comes to you. But their primary requirement now is to manage that inflation um, and to help people, I guess, with their daily lives. So... They'll try and do that. They'll probably do it, I expect, next March. Um, but I doubt they'll do it every three months. 
2022, uh, I think in a way, I think this range we're currently in 30 to 60 K is going to be the driving force of the year until we get some kind of trigger event. It could be one or two big institutions announcing they're doing it. It could be another Southern American country announcing that it's going to be legal tender. And, and depending on the size of, of the country or company and the acquisition, that will drive how much we break out of that. But otherwise, I would expect us to spend quite a bit of time in this kind of region. So very different to, you know, rewind a year, start of January 2021. I saw a big bull market ahead of us uh, where I was expecting, you know, 100 to 200K, minimum 50, got the minimum 50, but obviously didn't get anywhere near the 100. A lot of the capital flowed down the stream into the old coins that we talked about. So this year, I don't have that same outlook. I think it's somewhere within that bound, um, but it can very easily break up if we get a couple of those announcements on the same side if you know the fed just hardens every quarter and the stock market drops 30 40 percent bitcoin will will have some pain as well just one headline that i'd love to read for you russia plans to tackle u.s sanctions with bitcoin investment says kremlin economist just think about that headline that's coming from the telegraph yeah. in the uk that is a nuts headline and you know i gotta tell you something about just news in general as you know blockworks we're, we're a news and media site I got to tell you, there's not a colossal difference in between like news headlines that come out in a bear versus a bull market. Mm. Like the same amount of good and bad news comes out. It's just how people react to them. Suzu back in like early 2021, right? He kind of coined this idea of the super cycle. And a lot of people misinter obviously misinterpreted it because they thought that that was going to be up only and crypto is going to yeah. just continue to rip straight to 20 trillion to market cap or whatever it was. But I think the point that he was trying to actually make, if you listen to him, was, was that these four-year cycles that Bitcoin is known for, anchored around the halvening, that, that can't continue into the future of crypto and Bitcoin is to succeed as an asset class in general. That has, that has to break yeah. at some point. And I think there are two, two different ways that you could look at the price action that we're seeing today, which is one, this is the super cycle. It's just people mm. didn't expect it, right? Because we, we have clearly departed, I would argue, from uh, what crypto has historically done. The other thing I think you can make a pretty strong argument for is that we actually did see a top back in April of 2021. And we have just been in a bear market. It just hasn't been a bear market that we've been used to. Because, you know, I, I kind of think back to 2017 and 2018 and how was I feeling at that time and what sentiment was like. And there's some pretty sharp divergences between, you know, e even after crypto popped, it was like it was like six months before people accepted that we were in a bear market. And now it's like, you know, one month after Bitcoin is off its highs, it's like, bear market. Sentiment has never yeah. been worse. There was a chart I saw on Twitter that investors were more bearish now than they were in March of 2020. Yeah. And to me, you know, a lot of that is just, I don't know, this feels more like we're nine months into a bear market or 12 months into a bear market sentiment wise than the first month of a bear market. Something's just not fully adding up to me, honestly. And, 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 that, and that just summarizes how different it, it, it has been in the last year. Um, and this decline in the last two and a half months, down 52%, almost in a straight line, twice that's happened in the last 12 months. Like even in Bitcoin, that's not heard of. So it, it doesn't make sense. It, it, it makes sense that sentiment is so so negative um, because it's it's never been like that, like in that fashion. Um, and yeah, good point about um, you know, Russia. I didn't see that announcement, but I did tweet something similar and it kind of plays into the game here and so many tensions in the world right now, um, you know, Russia, Ukraine, question marks there about possible war, you know, China, US and Taiwan. And and it's a function of, it's, it's a symptom really of, of this debt cycle and, and growing powers and shifting orders. And there's so many forces at play right now in the world um, and which are overlapping in crypto. And I think Bitcoin is perfectly placed for, you know, to grow out of this in, in terms of our money. And and it makes sense for countries which may or may not be kicked out of different financial systems to, you know, want to explore this area more. And that plays into the game theory that we just talked about of adoption being driven to the upside for Bitcoin. Yeah, I completely agree. Zoning in a little bit on some of these on-chain metrics that you paid attention to. You had a tweet the other day that Bitcoin was entering its value zone. And one question that I've been asking a lot of folks on this podcast is, where do you see Bitcoin as a value buy? Um, so I guess my question for you is, what are some of those on-chain metrics that you're paying attention to? Uh, and then where, you know, if I had to put you on the spot and say, at what point does the market think that Bitcoin is a value buy? You know, what would you answer to that? 
Yeah, I, I think there's a good case that, yeah, like I said, we're, we've entered it. Um, and it's just, yeah, there's, there's so many metrics you can look at and, and there's a lot which are noise and the ones which are important changes with time. Um, so the ones which hold up pretty consistently through time and, and have worked reasonably well as well in the last 12 months are the ones I look to. And one is dynamic range uh, NVT. So the basically the you know the P ratio of Bitcoin. It's a classic one. It's nothing uh, you know super sexy or fancy, but it shows you when Bitcoin's relatively cheap. And we entered that zone um, a couple of days ago. It can last for a while. It can last for a couple of weeks or months historically, but it usually means you're in a great region to buy if you want to hold it for you know a, a year or two plus. So that's that's one big tick. There's a lot of other parameters, you know, funding rates have been pretty consistently low or negative. So there's not a lot of exuberance in the market. Looking at macro, we have some of those bearish sentiment we've seen in decades at the moment. And and macro, a lot of macro or, or S&P indicators, you know, put call ratios, different things which measure risk on and off are at places where we would either normally bounce and see a, a incredibly strong rally or the market's about to die. <laughs> die being like 2008 or some right. horrible crisis, right? So probability-wise, yeah, it could happen. Or it could be the case, but more likely is that it's actually a value zone in, in that respect. Um, then the question I've been thinking about a lot recently is if we are in a bear market, you know, and you just think about Bitcoin, none of the factors we've spoken about, um, where could Bitcoin go from here? So I... The most valuable metrics for me in prior bear markets were Bitcoin production cost um, and energy value. And typically when we're below them, it's all, it's a great long-term buy. We're not there yet, but we are touching on production cost. We did hit it the other day. It's around 33K at the moment, which is basically mm-hmm. the average price to mine a Bitcoin, including all business costs. We can go, like most metrics, we can go below that. The floor historically has been the electrical price, which is basically at the price at which it's no longer worth mining any Bitcoin, you may as well just turn off your power, basically. That's at $20,000. So that that number can change a lot too. Um, like if the hash rate, you know, or America or some other country is to ban mining, I'm sure the hash rate will collapse and so will that value, right? So that's always a risk. But all else equal, it's growing very strongly. Um, you know, we just saw today Russia is talking about regulating and allowing mining. So I only see that number going up in the coming years. So... That floor is raising with time um, at most periods. So it's 20K right now. You know, in a few months, it might be 25 or 30. So that's probably my worst case scenario right now is a drop to 20K. Um, and it's like I said, it's worst case. It's pessimistic. We're seeing a lot of factors say we're in this bullish space. Sentiment is so bearish, as you talked about in crypto, but also macro, that the vast majority of times you will see a bounce somewhere here. So Anywhere between 20 and 35K is a great long-term buy. So basically today even. Um, and long-term being if you're a hodler and you're, or you're looking to hold it for at least, you know, uh, two to five plus years, you can't go wrong really in my personal opinion, but obviously do your own research, not financial advice. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's in that, that value region for sure in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And for viewers who are watching this on video, you can see the sun is actually rising here, which is why it looks like the light of God is shining <laughs> onto my face. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, Charles, my question for you too, you know, you, you have this great note um, in your in your piece uh, recently that came out from Capriol, uh, just about the changing market structure of crypto in general. And if you, if you kind of start with, you know, the inception of, you know, the crypto market, let's call it 2013, because before that it was like pretty, pretty immature, but it was still vastly a market that was dominated by retail traders and Bitcoin miners in general. Maybe one of the reasons is different this time is because the market structure has changed and it is more institutional. If it's not a fully institutional market, especially when it comes to Bitcoin, institutions and, and hedge funds and, you know, have much more of an influence that they used to. So kind of walk us through what are some of the most important changes that you see in actually the market structure uh, of Bitcoin specifically? And I know you, you, you track exchange reserves uh, pretty closely as well. So if you could uh, touch on exchange reserves in your answer, that'd be great. Yeah. So definitely change, the market structure has definitely changed a lot in the last 12 months. In general, I think it's slower moving. Um, it might not look like it when you see the volatility, but the volatility is still there, but it's slower moving in terms of, of, of trends and appreciation. Um, 
things that or structures that used to play out, you know, in, in hours or days are now taking weeks or months. Um, even this most recent decline, you know, the last month and a half, two months, we've been had certain readings which would suggest historically that, you know, there'd normally a bounce by now, but it, it just hasn't happened. So things have morphed. Um, certain metrics are not that useful anymore. So there's a lot we, in recent months, have stopped looking at. Um, and there's there's many, yeah, like the, the main reasons that uh, I would say institutions, different holding periods, the way they custody assets. So the last two or three years, we saw a lot of capital flow into exchanges. And it was like this period of centralization of crypto. The last year or two, it's been flowing straight out, almost in a straight line. We're near lows, of, we're at lows of the last few years. And a lot of institutions are, you know, custing their assets on platforms where they have multi-sig or MPC, other distributed wallets um, through, you know, Fireblocks or, or, or Copper or various other big platforms. And that means that they now have the capability to trade on exchanges with a credit line. So effectively, you could have a billion dollars in some, you know, cold storage and you just trade in the net P&L or that entire value on the exchange without the Bitcoin actually being there. So... There's things like that where I kind of, if, if institutions keep adopting and governments keep adopting, you would expect outflow to keep continuing. And that doesn't necessarily mean that outflow is not going to impact price. So historically, we would have looked at the outflow and be like, oh, there's lots of buyers, um, you know, accumulating for the long term. They're putting in their cold storage. Great. There's less liquidity in exchanges. It doesn't necessarily mean that now. I think on net, you, you know, if you had to have one or the other, you definitely want outflows because there's less, you know, liquidity you know for the average holder on an exchange but it's just different um you also have the lightning network which is starting to take off and and other side chains or or, or, you know liquid network and other things where the the movement and flow of capital is just so different now to just two or three years ago where it was very visible and clear and almost concise um and that's only going to get more complex um and um you know harder to perhaps discern at a face value at least with you know perhaps DeFi and other applications merging into bitcoin so we we see that with ethereum not really there at a bitcoin at this stage but if that happens there's going to be much more different flows to consider and and that means you can't just take things at face value and it also means you probably want to look for more extreme deviations if you're going to look at those metrics so as we go through this phase it just means you have to the the past or at least the more distant past is much less relevant like you mentioned pre-2013 i i've basically never even taken much notice of that data or what worked then because it's just a straight line up and mm. it's so much noise and expansion that it's not worth modeling in the present period now we're at a space where you definitely want to be looking at what is more relevant in recent times versus the last 10 years. Another one, the, the article you talk about, the Caprioli update for 2022, um, we talked about MVRV, which mm. is the um, ratio of the, the market value to the realized value on chain. And it, historically, it's been a great indicator of overvaluation and undervaluation. I still think it's very good, but if you just look at that chart zoomed out, the extremities have been dropping very consistently through time. Um, and I just don't expect you will get that it comes back to what I was saying before, you can't get that parabolic, um, you know, massive spikes in price when you've got a trillion dollar asset because it takes so much more capital to move. Um, so there's a lot of dampening of that level of extremity that Bitcoin has seen in, in recent years. And, and a, it's just been a step change basically in the last 12 months and how that in, impacts everything in the market. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. I talk to a lot of fast-growing crypto-native funds, crypto banks, exchanges, and the like, and they all tell me they have the same two problems. One, their treasury management setup sucks. They've got analysts wasting time and money on manual transactions. Two, they are not happy with their current security setup. They're sharing passwords, they're sending test transactions, and they're worried that their funds might be at risk. Fireblocks is a platform that solves all of that for you. They're a one-stop shop portal which automatically plugs into exchanges, trading venues, etc. They source deep liquidity and solve everything from day-to-day crypto transactions all the way down to complex DeFi strategy. And the best thing about Fireblocks is that they offer scalable solutions with industry-leading technology. 
Doesn't matter if you're a two-person crypto fund or a 2,000-person crypto exchange, these guys have you covered. And the last thing that I'll say about this company is that I have known them for years. They are a high integrity team. They ship product like no other. I would trust them with my own funds. So click the link at the bottom of this page and tell them that I sent you. Very, very important that you click the link at the bottom here. Otherwise, they're not going to know that I sent you. And then how am I going to get credit? So help a brother out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. Got it. I want to kind of close with your thoughts on other parts uh, of crypto in general. So we talked a little bit about, you know, at the opening of this conversation about how actually alts, uh, you know, non, I don't really love that word, honestly, but like non crypto, uh, non Bitcoin crypto assets, right, kind of outperform Bitcoin in 2021. Um, you know, I, I saw you tweet recently about kind of Ethereum in general, and, and I'd love to get your thoughts on Ethereum's decision to kind of brand itself as an ultrasound money, right, and in some ways kind of compete with Bitcoin and adjust their monetary policy there. And just any thoughts that you had on kind of the, the burgeoning L1 ecosystem in general. Too. Yeah, that uh, tweet I did about Ethereum created a bit of controversy. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so yeah, it, Ethereum is uh, an interesting one. I think as an application layer, um, there's, it's, it's super exciting. They've done groundbreaking stuff. They're seeing massive adoption. They're seeing faster growth than Bitcoin. It is also smaller. We do have to take into account that smaller assets are going to obviously grow faster relatively if they have something good to offer. Um, but yeah, so the, they've obviously had a very mixed, complex history with their distribution, inflation model. Um, there's been a number of red flags there in the past. Um, but if you just crunch the raw numbers and look at the data, it has in the last few months had a lower inflation rate than Bitcoin. Now, people argue all sorts of philosophy about that, but the data says it is inflating at a lower rate than Bitcoin. So it's only been three months, so that doesn't necessarily mean anything long term. But honestly, if that is maintained for multiple years, it's going to cause a capital shift to some degree out of Bitcoin. I have no doubt of that. The difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum here is that the Bitcoin policy, you know, the expectations, inflation rates, everything is like embedded in stone for the next hundred years. Right. So that gives confidence. And the fact that Bitcoin's been around now for like 12, 13 years, it's proven itself. It's, you know, it's, you know, battle hardened that yes, this policy works. Yes, it's going to keep happening. And no, it's not going to zero. It's now a trillion dollars mm-hmm. or it was a trillion dollars recently. So that makes it harder money to a lot of people and particularly bitcoiners today that or, or maxis that love it because of that confidence it's built and and shown and lack of change that it's going to theoretically have and i agree with that completely i think bitcoin is a fantastic hard money um i i i don't think ethereum competes on that ground at this point um but it's a time thing, right? Uh, confidence and trust is built with time, but it breaks overnight. So Ethereum's done a lot of things which have broken trust in the past for a lot of people. But in theory, like if you fast forward five years, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if it did happen that, you know, it was more decentralized, their policy and ETH2 rolled out and it was deflationary like they're planning. So it was literally deflating while Bitcoin was inflating. And perhaps at that point it had been doing it for four or five years that's going to tra- cause a massive narrative shift um, if the model works, right, to to that asset. So I think it's a time and trust-based thing which builds up. And, and of course, assuming I'm assuming a lot of things here, right, like that it would get locked into the, to the model and that somehow it wouldn't be changed yet. But I don't think that's going to necessarily happen. It was seen with these two, right? It's, it's years behind schedule. So mm-hmm. anything they kind of do or, or change or lock in is going to take years to play out. And then from there, you'd need some baseline point where it was consistent over time to build that trust of a hard money. So it, it, it's not going to compete directly with Bitcoin that front in the near term. But if it continues what it's doing in that space, I think, yeah, it is, it's a threat to Bitcoin if Bitcoin doesn't have other things to offer. Um, but maybe by that point, it's, uh, it's also too late. So I, I think we're going to see some you know, countries and, and large institutions acquire and announce and, and cause that game theory element to Bitcoin. So like incredibly bullish Bitcoin in the long term. And if that happens, you also reach a critical mass point with that type of thing, kind of like gold, right? Where 
if if Bitcoin has proven itself consistent, it's low or near zero inflation, it's digital, you don't necessarily need uh, another hard asset or, or global money for that, you know, as a, as a competitor. But so it, it really depends on consistency and time is basically what I'm saying. And Ethereum doesn't have a history of that. <laughs> it has right. a history of the opposite. So um, both great investments for different reasons, in my opinion. Um, for myself, um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a long term risk to Bitcoin if they keep up what they're doing, and Bitcoin doesn't have something else to offer. I view Bitcoin and Ethereum as actually trying to do pretty different things, frankly. Yeah. And I guess I think you could make you know the flip side of that argument is that you know there's actually no reason for Ethereum to be this ultrasound money, and in, in a way. I wonder if that's just almost ideology that got copied over from Bitcoin. Like you got to put yourself in the shoes of when Ethereum was getting created, the entire narrative around Bitcoin, right? It, Bitcoin was really the only substantial project back then. And the whole, this whole narrative of what we're doing here is building, you know, a store of value that's uncensorable money, you know, sovereign free money and all that kind of stuff. But my question is like, do you think a smart contract platform really requires that? Because, you know, in a way the the downside of that is, A, now you're competing with Bitcoin. And I'm kind of of the opinion that Bitcoin is the king when it comes to sound money. I don't, I, just, I think they've already won. I don't see anyone really competing with that. Yeah. And now who they're competing with, ETH is competing with all these other L1s, right? And they're like, mm-hmm. they, they kind of, like, if you talk to Anatoly, you know, at Solana, think what I know they've been down for 72 hours, whatever. They have a different religion in that community. Their religion is speed and efficiency. And honestly, if this is a smart, it's a tech platform, those are huge value propositions yeah. for tech. So my, my, my curiosity is, have they picked a fight on the wrong battlegrounds, which is now they're trying to weirdly compete as a smart contract platform and as a form of ultrasound money. And I'm just not sure you're going to beat Bitcoin at that. Yeah, I'm on the same page as this completely. I don't think they're really competing in that space now. Um, I, I, I suppose I'd like to play devil's advocate even with the last, my last answer to this is with all these things and not get too locked in a philosophy or a narrative because it changes with time and the opportunity comes when something is, you know, before it's interpreted as a particular thing or, or it's this or it fits in that box or what have you. So I'm open-minded to it all. I, I don't invest in Ethereum as a hard money. I would invest in it personally, perhaps as, for the application layer, you know, the opportunity it has as an L1 and, and things mm-hmm. it's building in finance and gaming and everything on it and NFTs and all that kind of stuff. But I'm on the same page. Here. I don't see it there yet, but I'm open-minded to it could happen one day. Um, it's probably low prior, uh, probability at this point because I don't, even though they're, they're doing these things, I don't think it's their focus area. I think their focus area is on, on like you say, competing with the other L1s. Uh, getting the speed work, getting it able to scale massively. I think that's their number one priority um, because it's the fees are so high. It's just not effective for mass adoption right now. So I think that is their priority, but it, it's just worth, I guess, tracking these things on the sideline. That's why that's where my interest is in that in that deflation because if it's consistent, it's long term, years down the track, that sort of thing can um, have great impacts. I suppose. Yeah. I guess my closing thoughts are here. So we're recording this again on January 27th. You know, there's this story floating around. I don't think it's totally confirmed at this point, but that, you know, this guy, there's a guy in, who's involved in Wonderland Finance. He's the CFO of Frog Nation. Mm. If folks on this, on this channel know it, um, a lot of you probably won't. But uh, basically, he's a, he's a big Anon developer in crypto. And it's kind of coming out right now that he might actually be one of the co-founders of the Quadriga Exchange in general. And... You know, just back to our just back to our conversation about this feels like the sentiment of something that's like nine months into a bear market. There's this great Jim Chanos quote. Uh, you can go back. There's this interview that he did on Masters of Business, like uh, Masters in Business, whatever the Barry Ritholtz channel is, uh, like four years ago. And he said this thing that stuck with me, which is that nobody cares about fraud on the way up, but they certainly do on the way down in markets. And I feel like, look, you know, the... Because I've been on that page too about, look, a lot of the innovation that's happening in crypto is not happening in the Bitcoin ecosystem and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, some of the some of it was clearly a thin line between innovation and fraud. I have no idea if this particular story is true and how much merit there is to it. But again, this just feels like, look, uh, it was clearly very frothy. A lot of the ideas that didn't yeah. have a lot of substance or whatever, they're getting unwound. Like this whole innovation around Ohm, which I'm convinced there's something there. But it was a 
brilliantly designed Ponzi scheme and it is unraveled extremely, extremely quickly. So I guess just like closing thoughts from you on like, you know, the state of the market outside of Bitcoin specifically, some of these either frauds or like, let's say ideas that were way out ahead of their skis. Because for me, I kind of look at it and like, you know, this might actually be either the bargain bin or it's like, wow, this could be way dirtier than we thought it was going to be. And actually Hasu tweeted something out, which is like, I find myself agreeing more with the crypto critics uh, than the supporters. It's like, wow, man, that's yeah. it's a bottom signal for me personally. <laughs> but um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, in a few places on that. I think it's, it's a great point. And, it, you know, those the varying levels of scams or con men or copycat projects or all those sort of things or, you know, different Ponzi type schemes. Uh, yeah, they're, they're not a con- concern on the way up, but then they all unwind the fastest and collapse on the way down and it can mm-hmm. compound down into other things. So anything which is like hot air or it doesn't have like a tangible use or a consistent kind of cash flow of something or, or which keeps users engaged is at the highest risk in a bear market in my opinion, in the crypto space, all of the alts in general are going to experience more downside volatility than crypto. Um, in terms of, yeah, where we're at in a possible bear market, you know, I, I can, like I said, I can easily see it's going down further on this stuff. Like sentiment is is bad, but if if stocks correct more or from here, then I think Bitcoin will take a bigger hit and probably more of these things will unwind. Um mm-hmm. So, so I think the main thing is if you if you're going to hear this to stick around, just to focus on on the projects with good reputations, with good roadmaps, a strong community. They're, they've actually got something you can use today or, or generate stable like real yield on, which isn't just token airdrops and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it there's very it's sifting through a large uh, you know selection of things to find those those niche opportunities um and even if it's a great project there's still high risk in it um that's for sure in any kind of crypto bear market so yeah yeah, you just have to bear that in mind Um, but yeah that story i saw that today as well about uh, this quadratics guy that's uh quite wild (laughs) wild if true honestly if that's true that is absolutely bananas and you know because that was a that was a story that like mainstream media picked up on you know that was in wall street journal and bloomberg and you know all those and if this ends up being true, this is going to be a huge, huge scandal, I would say. Um, yeah, and I guess that's the risk with a non-developers, right? I'm sure most are, are fine, but you, there's always a bit of a question mark there, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But isn't this healthy? Isn't this nature healing? Like, to me, I you know, like, <laughs> look, what, would it be better if number going up? Would, would I be happier if I checked my, you know, my Coinbase, my MetaMask and saw a higher number? I would be happy. But honestly, I kind of look out and... Just to end on maybe a high note, like I remember in 2017, and I saw it when Bitcoin or when crypto hit its market cap of 800 billion, and thinking to myself, "This is insanity." Like it felt to me so far out ahead of its skis, and maybe I've just been really red pilled since then. But I'm looking out at crypto today at two times that at 1.6 trillion, being like, "This just feels cheap." I'm sorry, it feels cheap. It's yeah. nuts to me that this entire yeah. market cap is less than individual companies. There are four individual companies in the S and P that are worth uh, more yeah. than the entire market cap of crypto, man. And, and the ratio, exactly. it's like all the things that are happening that you kind of want to see are kind of happening. Bitcoin is holding up better than these speculative alts. Even if you look at like the ratio between ETH and the alternative layer ones, it's about where I kind of feel like it should be. ETH is about twice the market cap of all the alt layer ones. Mm. I'm not including Cardano in that. Sorry, Cardano. Uh, you know, <laughs> and I just kind of feel like a lot of the, the flagrant Ponzi's are getting flushed out. And to me, this just feels like nature healing, man. I, that's that's yeah. my conclusion. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and that's the beautiful thing about crypto. It's like the only free market in the world right now where this yeah. happens. <laughs> so it it turns a lot of people off because of the volatility. But it's 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 the most natural market we have. Um, mm-hmm. And long term, that is much more sustainable. Um, you know, we're seeing that controlled markets. They just historically, and we're seeing the risk factors blow up now just result in bigger and bigger, you know, risk compounding over time. So, yeah, I hope crypto can stay as free and open as possible for as long as possible. I think, you know, elements of regulation are good, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the less 
manipulative control, the better. And, and it, it's nature healing, as you say, in many of these projects. So. I totally agree, Charles. Um, well, look, man, thanks so much for joining us. This has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, if folks want to find out more about you, uh, the, the fund that you run, the, some of the research that you guys do, what's the best way to follow you, find out more about Capriol? Yeah, thanks, Michael. It's been great, great to chat with you and talk about all things crypto and uh, the, the year ahead. It's going to be exciting for sure. Um, yeah, so you can check out, um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Caprioli.io or, or, or check out Caprioli.com to learn more about me and the team. Excellent. All right, Charles. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, we'll have to do it again sometime soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Michael. Cheers. Cheers.